today. He is so, so very good. He didn't owe us anything, but he gave us everything. So I'm thankful for that. I'm so glad for all of you that are here on Mother's Day. If you have a mother and you're not having called her or said happy Mother's Day, you need to do so. Mothers are priceless. I said to my husband when he was here, I said, uh, you don't do as much as I do. I mean, you got a baby, but that's about it. From that point on, everything is on my shoulders. It really is the truth. You're the one that's up at night. I remember when I had the twins, and uh, I, wrote, I woke my husband. I said, honey, could you please help me with these babies? Because I can't get no sleep. I don't know which one cried last and which one I fed last. I'm getting cross-eyed and everything. And he said, Rose, I'll do what I can, but I got to go to work in the morning. Thanks a lot. He got up a little while, and then he got back in the bed, and it was, something went on for about 30 days. And finally, my heart began to flutter real bad. Couldn't, didn't, couldn't beat right. Went to the doctor. He said, you are exhausted. And I said, you know why? I got two babies at one time. I'm used to taking care of one. But at this time, it's two of them, and I'm telling you, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. But I'm thankful I got some good children. Every once in a while, somebody turns out bad, but for the most part, we got some good kids, so I'm thankful for that. We love you. We're glad that you're here this morning, and uh, I'm so glad that 
when I leave this service today, I go home, and that's when all the goodies come out and all the packages and all that good stuff. And it makes you really happy you got seven because everybody got to buy you something. <laughs> yeah, so it's just not one, <laughs> one kid. All of them got something going on. So I'm thankful for being here. Barbara, I'm so glad your family's here. God bless y'all. Yes. Long time since I've seen you, but good to see you. Let's, I'm not going to preach a Mother's Day message. This is probably something you're not accustomed to. Somebody's going to talk about Hannah, and somebody's going to talk about this one. That ain't what this is about. We know all about all that. Now, where I'm preaching from this morning is Genesis. If you can't find Genesis, you never read your Bible. <laughs> Genesis is the very first book in the Bible. Yeah. If you can't find that, something's wrong with you. Yes. But let me get ready and preach. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this morning for your blessings. We thank you because you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. I pray for every person in this building that you'd reach out and touch their lives. I pray, God, that you'd work a work as only you can do it. I pray now for the anointing upon thy servant, for without you we can do nothing. With you we can do anything, and we'll give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening, morning, were the second day. I'm not going to go through all this. I'm going to skip down, so I, I don't want to have to read all this. But I want to say that from the beginning that God started creating things making the earth, and what I liked about it, it's no better feeling in the world to feel like you've accomplished something and it was good. And as God went through all of these things, everything he made, at the end of it, he said, this is good. And I thought about that this week, and, and for a moment, I thought to myself, when he reached one point, and what point was that? That point was, he said, let us make man. Everything was good. Even man was good. Everything that God ever made, it was good. The only sad thing about this is that man didn't stay good. The trees and everything, the ocean, everything that he did, all of those things stayed good. The birds obey him, the, all the people, all the fish and the things that are in the sea and the wildlife and everybody is under command and they obey God. What's wrong with man? After God says, I'm going to make man in my image, in my image, like us. And then what did he get for it? He got nothing. He gave him, he put him in the Garden of Eden. He gave him everything. You could have everything in the garden. You know what? Man was going to never die. Man would have never had pain. Women would have had babies without pain. That would have been nice. And so as you look at this whole picture, and you think that God just made it beautiful for us. If anybody can mess up something, just leave it to people. We can make a mess of things. And then we want to know why God has allowed us. Why did God allow this to happen to me? He didn't. He made you perfect. He made you upright. He made you the perfect person that he wanted you to be. And you never would have to want for nothing. Because when he put you in the garden, everything was there. And man gets off. Now God said, 
You can have everything in this garden. Help yourself with it. But don't eat of this one tree. Oh, what is it about man? As sure you can give him everything, he still wants something else. And if it's a touch me not, if it's something that we should not be involved with, oh, we want that. What is that? Man has a will that is destroying his own life. Even to this day, is God still disappointed with man? Because when you look down at the condition of the world today, that's not the way God envisioned this world. That's not what he envisioned for your life and for my life. And so when I look around, I see all these things. It's worse. Every, the longer you live, the worse the world gets. The worse people get. They go from one extreme to another extreme all over the place. I thought, what a disappointment. You sit here this morning. I'd like for you to think for a moment, am I disappointing God? Because you still ain't done things right. You're still on the wrong pathway. So when I looked at that, I said, God, how grieved your heart must be. How sad it must be. Because this is not what you envisioned for them. I made a family, God's family. I made them perfect. They didn't want for anything, and they messed it all up. He looked down and said, I looked down when I saw a man, he was wicked. And that every imagination of his own heart was messed up. God didn't do it. It's because we listen to the devil. And whatever the devil tells you to do, you do that. And when he gets through with you, he destroys you. God is the only one that do things for us and continue to do good. And continue to do good. He doesn't do that. Why do? What is it about man that always wants the wrong thing? We don't want what's good. We're always reaching out for something else. I... Thought back this morning, I was getting my kids ready to go to church. And, of course, I had a lot of them to get ready, so I had to get up early. And my baby was Lisa at the time. She was the youngest. And I thought, I'm going to take Lisa to church tonight. And I put on this little pink crocheted dress, little drawstring in the, in the waist, and little ruffled socks and, and put a little bow in her hair. She was looking so pretty. So I set her on the bed, and I said, I'll be back. Sit there, Mama, be back. And she sat there looking just like a little doll, except when I came back. <laughs> when I came back, what I found, we had left this uh, hair oil sitting on the bed. And the hair all was blue. When I went back in the room, she was sitting there. She was so happy. And all of this blue hair all was all into the, because the dress was like, like a knit, but it was crocheted. But uh, uh, it's all in, in, intertwined. It's all on her face and her, her socks. And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went back, I said, no. I got everybody put you, got you ready, and I just got to slip on my clothes. And what do I find here? I looked at her, she looked at me just like, what's wrong? And I couldn't change all that and get, them, get her ready for church. So I had to leave her with her daddy and just leave. I, I was so upset. I thought, honey, you look so pretty. She said, yeah, yeah, yeah. She don't even know what's going on. I want to say to you, when God came back to the Garden of Eden, everything was beautiful when he left. Day after day, he would come down and communicate with Adam. He wanted this fellowship. He wanted him to love him as he loved, as he loved. And I remember when I thought about that, I said, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that to this day, man is a great disappointment to you. I hope by living my life for you, I hope in some way that I can make up for those who didn't want you. I hope that by my commitment, my dedication, 
to you would mean something. And I hope I can give you enough that will compensate for somebody. Because nothing is worse than being disappointed. Every person in this room at somewhere, sometime in your life, you went through a situation that you was greatly disappointed with. Oh, my God, what is this? And God is saying, I'm going down now to see Adam, and we fellowship in the garden. But when he got there, apparently, the way the scripture puts it, apparently, he met God in, as he came to the garden. And when God got there, he wasn't there. He said, Adam, Adam, where are you? I wonder this morning, I don't know everybody's name in this building, but I wonder if God is calling your name, asking you, where are you at? This is not the way I created you. This is not what I expected. This is not what I was looking for. Where are you? Would he be calling your name because you somewhere you shouldn't be? Would he be calling your name because when you should be in his house on Sunday, where are you at? Would he be calling your name because you won't do anything else but to come to the house of God and make a hundred excuses why you couldn't be here? Think about it. So now he's looking for Adam. He's looking for fellowship, a time that he can uh, talk and, and interact with Adam. But he's nowhere to be seen. After God called him enough times, he and, he and Eve began to come out. and. They were holding their heads down. Where are you? They said, Lord, we heard you, but we're naked. Who told you that? Because the way I created you, you would have never known you were naked. I say sometimes, it may be funny, but I say sometimes, Lord, if nothing good came out of, of the Garden of Eden, it was it, it, the fact that we had to put on clothes. <laughs> so... God, help us when we come to church naked. That would be something. <laughs> so I look at that and say, thank you at least for that, even though it wasn't good. Uh, we never have church. No. <laughs> so, but Adam now is trying to explain to God, as some of you, no doubt, will try to do today. Well, it's not that I don't want to go to church. It's just I'm so busy. I, I got to work on Sunday. Don't get a job that makes you work on Sunday. You know, in our day coming up, you didn't work on Sunday. The businesses in this country were closed on Sunday. I mean, you couldn't even get gas on Sunday unless you got it Saturday night. No filling stations was open. No grocery stores was open. No businesses open on Sunday. What happened to this world? All of a sudden, you look around, everybody's open. You can do business seven days a week if you want to. But I think at some point, since God said, I, I rested on the seventh day, he said, that's the Sabbath. That's the day I want you to set aside just for me, not go to work, none of those things, just for me on Sunday. They still won't do it. All these years later, they'll take jobs that takes them out of church. It's like it's okay. It's not okay. Do you know what the seventh meant to God? The seventh day was the day that he called his day. And we give the time to everybody but God. We don't really have to do it. I've seen our members in the church turn it down, and God gave them something so much bigger. So much bigger. At one point, when he looked at Adam, he said, this is good. Then he was so concerned about him, he said, it's not good for him uh, to be alone. So I'm going to give him somebody to help him out. Men couldn't make it in this world without women. I don't care how macho and how big they think they are. You need a woman, a real woman to give you some knowledge and understanding, some strength. <laughs> see things you don't see. It's true. You say, well, Sister Rose, I don't, I don't think it really was. You may have a problem with that, but you'll be all right. <laughs> See? Then I looked at this, and God said, how did man become so corrupt and so evil? I made him perfect. I made him righteous. I made him holy. So how is it that he became this? All of us as parents, all of us have 
visions in our head what we want for our kids. We want this for our kids. If we didn't have it as a kid, we're hoping we can give it to our kids. Sometimes they don't, they don't have your dream. It don't take you long to find that out. You got these dreams, a little thing in the crib, and one day you'll be president. <laughs> I don't think I ever told my kid that, but you, but you look at them and you think, wow, what, what is this person going to be? What are they going to contribute to the world? And you watch them grow up and change and mature, and all of a sudden a little nasty wheel comes out. I don't want to do that. But, Mama, why, why that? My kids was very careful in handling that with me. But I thought, gosh, you got so many dreams. God had a dream. This is what I see man at. He's going to be all these things, except he found out, no, he wasn't. He, the Bible said he was grieved to his heart. You sitting here this morning are still grieving him to his heart. If you haven't repented of your sins, if you haven't uh, submitted your life to God, if you haven't chosen to make him the Lord and the master of your life, he's grieved. Why are you still causing him pain? When does God look down and say, I finally got it? I finally got it. This is what I always wanted. Only those people who are willing to sell out of who they are, submit their will to him, and say, God, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Those are the people that can stop the grieving. Are you one of those people this morning? Don't you think that you should be? If you came in here and that's really not your thing, you know, my plan is to do this and to do that and to go here and to go there. And that's all well and good. But quit putting God in the background of your life and then turn around and ask, well, I don't know what's going on. I can tell you this morning. You're one of those people who's still causing him pain today. As he looks down and see what's in the world and, and he watches man continually to deteriorate and become immoral, and, and he wants to do his thing. Morality in this country is at an all-time low. Can't only find moral people. People are so, you can't hardly trust anybody. Because if I do, who are you? Can I really talk to you? Can I really trust you? More and more, we don't have people that reach out and help others. As we wouldn't have so much pain in the world. He said, if it's a good God up there, why do you let these people be hungry? Because he made it possible that you could feed some of them. Why don't you do it? You got more than enough. More than enough to share with somebody. So, the scripture says, God is angry with the wicked every day. And wicked is people that don't serve God, who don't live right. They do all these other things. They don't really, they don't really get down to business with God. If they got to make a doctor's appointment and the only time you can get it on Sunday, then God's going on the shelf. We don't mind saying, I would, but I got other plans. What about God? I ask, what about God? See, we don't have any standard anymore. Standard is something that's set that we all measure up to. Where is it? Where is it? Do you have any type of standard? Things, there are some lines you just won't cross. There are some things I just won't do. Why? Because I love God too much to do it. Yes, I love him too much. I look at this, and my heart is touched. Because when you get close enough to God, his pain is your pain. What is that noise? Something's sounding off. I don't know if it's coming from under this thing or wherever. Y'all find out where it's at. Yes. But God said, this is beautiful. This is good. Only to find out that man says, I don't want to do this. I want to do my own thing. You know what you hear now? This is my life. Nobody tells me what to do. This is my life. I live it the way I want to live it. This is not your life. Your life belongs to God. Right today, if he takes back 
the breath that you breathe, you wouldn't be here. If he didn't give you strength this morning to get up and get to this building, you wouldn't be here. Yes. So how, how is it your life? You couldn't move your legs. You couldn't raise your hand. You couldn't get to the next room in your house if it wasn't for God. Everything that we do, how we function from day to day is based upon where God is in our life. And he loves you and in spite of it, those that still hate him, those that still won't serve him, he's even good to them. He said when the sun comes out and everybody wants the sun, it's a beautiful time of the year. But, but you know what? You wouldn't have that sunshine if it wasn't for him. It's something about the sunshine that makes you feel like you want to go on a hike or run somewhere or do something. But when it's cloudy, it's like, oh, it's crawl back in the bed. He sends the clouds. He sends the rain when we need it. So the earth is being watered again. He's taking care of all this. Everything is on schedule with God. He's an orderly God. Everything is on schedule. When it's time for, uh, for winter to come, when it's time for summer, everything starts turning. He's in charge of it. Everything. I think sometimes, do you think that because you are blessed today, well, that's supposed to happen to me. No, it is not. No, it is not. You didn't just have to be blessed. You didn't just have to miss that bad accident. You didn't have to be uh, saved off of a flight that went down. Come on. This man said when the man came in the Waffle House in Texas, I think it was Texas, you hear it? Mm -hmm. You can hear it. I don't know what it is. But anyway, he said the man was shooting people. He said he heard a voice said, take him now. So he went in and he wrestled with this man. He got the gun away from him. I think he got shot in the process. I'm not sure, but... He, he got the gun. So Steve Harvey said to him, so who would you say that voice is? And why do we have to explain before we talk about God? He had to explain that. I don't want anybody to think I'm a fanatic. I don't care what you think. I don't want anybody to think I'm this over-religious person. You got to do all this explaining about God. And then he says, I believe it was God. Well, I don't care if you think I'm a fanatic. I don't care what you think. The bottom line is, if I believe in my heart that God has directed me, that's a blessing. It don't need an explanation. Yes. Look how people now don't want to let nobody know I'm a Christian. Shout it out. Shout it out. I'm not going to be quiet. You can't put me in a room with one or two people. I'm somewhere. I'm going to mention the God that's taking charge of my life. Somewhere I'm going to tell you about the one that I love. Somewhere you will find out, oh, you're a Christian, I see. Yes, I am. I'm not ashamed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's the power of God unto salvation. I'm not ashamed. Yeah, I'll talk about it. He said, but if you be ashamed to own me in front of this adulterous generation, God will also be ashamed to, uh, 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 to recognize you in the presence of his father. No, I'm not ashamed. But you're different. Is there something that makes you different? And we beat around, well, not really. We don't want to tell them I'm a Christian. Tell them you're a Christian because in this day and hour, liars are Christians. Crooks are Christians. Homemongers are Christians. People do anything they want to do, and everybody's a Christian, but they're not. But they'll tell you they are. And you know, according to Scripture, that they're not. Scripture said God saw that man's heart was wicked, and his heart was only evil continually. As he looked down, where is all this? Satan, the devil, was taking control of people's lives. And they were allowing him to do that. You don't, have to let, you don't have to let the devil take control of your life. We have the power. If we submit to God, we got the power. We don't have to give in. We don't have to do that. Because number one, I believe without a doubt that he's protecting me. 
the angels of the Lord encamps round about those that fear him. So if he's encamped round about me, what do I have to fear? Nothing. But the only way you're going to get the angels, you have to live right. You got to submit to God. Don't try to claim our promises. It ain't for you. I mean, the promises are to those who live, who live and serve God. Listen, I remember as I was studying that we don't, God can't count on many people for anything, not even preachers in this hour. I have never seen so many preachers. I never dreamed I'd live long enough to see what I'm seeing. And these preachers lying to people and money and money and more money. I said, God, only you can help your people to see past this stuff. You got to see past it. The things of this life that are material, they don't give man fulfillment. They don't make you happy. The simple fact is, if that was where joy was, if that's where happiness was, why did Jesus bother to come and suffer for us? That's not going to make you happy. Think about it. I need more than that in my life. I don't care what it is in this world, it gets old real quick. I don't care how pretty it is. I don't care how nice it is. It gets old real quick. So look at your life and say, wait a minute. I need to wrap myself up in God. I need something eternal. I need something that's not here today and gone tomorrow. I need something every day of my life. And you can have it because he made it possible for you to have it. Why are you stepping over all the good for the bad? I'm going after the bad thing. Why? This is good over here. No, I don't want that. You know, when I was, uh, after I started having my children and they come home for lunch from school sometimes, I would make them lunch. I'd be in the kitchen uh, making a salad and, and fried chicken and, and some peas and getting all this ready. You know what they did? Do we have to eat that? I thought I'd be making you a hot lunch, for God's sake. I just want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You would rather have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich than to have a good balanced meal. I felt so aggravated. I thought I took this time out of my time to get you a hot lunch and you want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I just got disgusted. Did I stop cooking it? No, I kept cooking. I made them eat some of it. They don't want to eat. You're going to eat it. We get up in the morning. I would set the table for Charles went to work early. So uh, later when the kids come down uh, for breakfast, and we always did it on Saturday morning because he was home, and I sat in the kitchen, fixed a nice, good breakfast. I got one kid who's a young, she hate eggs with a passion. And so I just put about that much eggs on the plate, about that much, that much. And eat a little bit of egg, just a little bit. I hate eggs. Then I had another one. Who Was that you that cried when you got to it? It was something that every time you got to it to eat it, you started crying. It was eggs. That aggravated me so bad. And she just, the family's having a great breakfast together. We're happy. We're talking, doing real good. And, and all of a sudden, we hear this. You better know it's an egg thing. <laughs> and it's about this much eggs for God's sake. You can eat that much. No. She's going to cry when she gets to the egg. She's going to eat the toast, the bacon, whatever we got. But when she gets to the egg, here comes the, here comes the drama. I, we're enjoying a family breakfast here. The sheep don't like eggs. So I just got the place. I wouldn't even put them on the plate. Because no matter what your, how little it is, she's going to make a scene. We want to have a nice breakfast as a family. I thought you just ain't going to get any then. Then I had one that don't like peas. I love green peas. I love them. Every time, every time. Same way. I hate peas. I said, eat it, honey. It's good for you. Eat the peas. It's good for you. I hate peas. To this day, she won't eat peas. Something's wrong with these kids. <laughs> Something's wrong. Because, see, when we were growing up, if peas was on the plate, you better eat it because you ain't got nothing else. 
you, you didn't have a choice. Well, if you don't want peas here, you can have broccoli or you can have this. Honey, that was it. You either eat that or you're going to be hungry. But, of course, in this modern day, we got, we got a variety of stuff. You don't like that? Okay, honey, well, what about this? Yeah. They didn't like greens. Don't like greens. Greens is very good for you. They didn't like them either. Some things they didn't finally catch hold of until they were grown. They say, oh, yeah, I love greens. Love greens. But I can't turn the pea girl. Now, the egg girl will eat eggs if it's cheese in them. But if it ain't no cheese in the egg, she's not having it. So I think sometimes God has set things out for us and say, now, this is very good for you. Look at it. I don't want to wait till I'm married to have sex. I want to have sex all the time. God said that's not good for you. That's why you got a disease. That's why you messed up. Yeah. He says now, Marriage is honorable. The bed's undefiled. Homemongers and adulterers, God said, I'm going to judge you. So now I'm going to tell you here's the best way for you. Here's, some, here's what you should do. You don't mind dating a little bit, but you don't date to the point that you can't contain. That's what a lot of people do. Well, you can't uh, climb to the top of the mountain and not expect your feet to slip off. <laughs> don't get to the top. Stay down here. For God's sake, and just take it easy. Well, when my kids were dating in the church, I said, at 10 o'clock, be in the house. I said, and don't sit in the car. After you get here, steaming up windows because people going to say something is going on. <laughs> That's right. Something's going on. Well, well, why is the windows steam? I said, come, when he drops you off, come in the house. Those were rules in this church. You don't start hugging and patting until you get married because hugging and patting leads to sex. I can, you know, I can, I can control myself. You can't do jack. It's a bunch of talk. You're no different from no other person. No, I need to take this thing slow. I need to be careful. In those churches, you can have sex and still go right on. Wait till you get married. That's why, for the most part, people don't worry about getting married no more because because cause the prize that comes on the honeymoon, that's been shot. <laughs> there ain't nothing left. I mean, hey, there ain't no excitement. Don't go on no honeymoon. You done mooned your honey already. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why, well, it's true. It's not that true. Yes. Come on, we on a honeymoon. How long? Were you? Well, we dated five years, ten years. Now, they didn't just date. They had sex for that long. Well, you won't have nothing to look forward to. The excitement. Boy, you, you, you remember years ago, we used to buy the Cracker Jack. And, and, and the Cracker Jacks, you, uh, you always want to hurry and get to the bottom because that's where the prize is. <laughs> there ain't no prize. It's all over. You got nothing. I would, I would pull my Cracker Jacks out. Get my prize out, open it up, and then go back to eating the Cracker Jacks. See? So God is saying there's a better way for man. A lot of heartbreak with women and men alike is simply because they get involved in relationships that's going nowhere. It's just a sexual thing. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be a thing called love that don't exist anymore. So, you know, we just, we're together. We just pass around, pass around over here and over there. I'm thinking, come on. People need to stop and think. Everything that God has put in this Bible for us, it works. It gives you happiness. It gives you joy. It gives you satisfaction. It gives you everything. <laughs> no, we'd rather have it different. I don't, want it. I don't want anything like that. Is it good for me? I don't want it. Water is very good for everybody. And I've had to tell people in this church, honey, have, are you drinking water? Come to me with a problem. You drinking water? I mean, I don't like water. Who says you have to like it? Drink it. Whether you like it or not, it's going to be good for you. There's a lot of things I learned to eat that in the past, early days of my life, I would not have done it. I never will forget the doctor that said on TV, she said, what you do in your youth, you will pay for it when you get older. It is the God sent truth. 
You have to change some things. Don't be stupid till you go to the grave. Take a moment. What's good for me? Uh, my chiropractor said to me one day, he said, Rose, have you ever tried uh, eating, uh, what is that? Uh, what's that green stuff? <laughs> huh? Avocado. Avocado. I said, mm-mm. <laughs> now, I never tasted it, but the look of it. I told him, I said, you know what that looks like? <laughs> Not having it. But I decided, since I talked to him when I go to see him again, and he said, uh, I'm, I'm saying, you know what, Dr. Adams? I tried, the, I tried that avocado. It's not bad. <laughs> I can't eat it. Do I like it? I wouldn't call it a love feast. But I believe I can eat it because it's healthy for me. So I did. And so he brought another piece down. I said, that ain't bad. But it always reminded me of my baby. I think that's why I couldn't eat it. You changing the diaper, look at what you see. I said, no. No, no, no. Don't want it. See? But once I tasted it, what I saw with my baby was not that. So you learn how to do things. You know what? You're going to give your life to God. You learn how to live right. You learn how to walk right. You learn how to talk right. You make up in your mind, this is a good thing, and I'm feeling better. I'm encouraged. I'm strengthened. Yes. Disappointment is a feeling always of dissatisfaction. And it's the sense that you, something failed you that you had great expectations for. Great expectations. That's what disappointment is. It is, brings a sense of deep sadness that I wish this had happened. I wish that had worked. I wish I could have gone there. I wish somehow I could have made that happen. Too many people look back on their lives and disappointed with the decisions they made that cost them almost their life and sometimes your life. Bad decisions. We make decisions. God said, look, I know all things, so I'm going to tell you, if you, want, if you want to do something and you don't know what to do, ask me. We don't ask God. And if time things go wrong, we say, why did God let this happen? No. He said, if you ask me, I'll show you not to do that, to do it this way. We don't want to do it that way. We treat God just like we do parents when you start growing up. I don't want you telling me, telling me how to run my life. That's the way we treat God, same way. Don't run my life. You need your life run because you don't know how to run it. It's, it's evident that you made a mess of things. So since I made a mess of everything, I think I need to listen. Listening is vitally important to growth. Listening is important for knowledge. I got I to gotta have knowledge of what I'm doing or what I should be doing. And I think a moment. Got to. So God is saying, I'm disappointed. My heart is grieved. It's sad. Let me go. He, God finally sent a flood and said, I'm just going to get rid of man. And he got rid of all of them except Noah who found favor with him because he was a righteous man. Put him in an ark, two of everything tells you that in the process of, of destroying everything, in the process he still wanted to preserve something. Because why would you want two of everything to last? Why would you put Noah in the ark? He still was longing for that relationship. I'm going to leave something left of what I did good. And then he went, when he looked at it, he said, never again. Well, I sent a flood to destroy a man. He loved you in spite of you. He's feeling sad. I destroyed him. Now I'm sad that I had to do it. Think about it. Why don't you say to God, Lord, you know what? I'm going to surrender my life to you. You don't deserve what I'm giving you. You don't deserve this. You deserve so much more than what I'm doing. We don't want to 
come to church on a Sunday night. We think we did God a favor Sunday morning. Are you kidding me? This is the person who sent his only son to die for you, to give his life, to suffer horribly on a cross. All the pain and the agony he went through to bring us back to God, give us a way out of hell, and give us fellowship with God. And you know what we did? You don't want to do that. Sunday night, are you, a, are you one of these fanatics? I said, think what you will, but I'm going back to church. One day out of a week, every person should give that day to God and say, Lord, this is your day in my life. I'm going to worship you. Yes. Sadness is a terrible feeling. You think you know what it is to certain things happen in your life and you feel sadness. I remember uh, Harold, Harold holding his wife. He was in that plane crash out in security when the plane went down in the ground and buried itself. And when I talked to her, she said, Rose, I've used the word sadness a lot in my life, but I have never, ever felt sadness until now. She said, the sadness is beyond comprehension. The sadness is beyond words. I cannot explain it. God said, I'm sad. You don't, you don't, you treat him like he don't have feelings. You're made in his image. You're made like him. So if you feel, he feels. If you hurt, he hurts. If you're happy, he's got a happy time. Think about it. When are you going to give back? Everybody that makes it in the world for the most part, when I say make it, I'm talking about uh, made money, uh, was, was prosperous in their, in their careers or whatever. They say, I, need, I feel like I need to give something back. Do you ever feel like you need to give God something back? Give something back. Quick, well, we were going to come back to church Sunday night, but this movie was coming on. You don't even have to stay home for movies. They got all these stupid uh, 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 high-tech crap. You can tape everything, write it down, do everything. You don't really have to be there. But you got to look at your life and say, is it time now for me to give something back? I say it is. What are you waiting on? You're not going to live forever. This is a debt that you owe. All of us owe that debt. What are we doing about it? I'm going to give something back. What are you going to give? Commitment. Dedication. I'm going to church. I don't care who comes by my house when I'm getting ready to go out. If you'd like to go to church with me, come on, but I got to go to church. No, we say, we were on our way out the door, and Jeannie and John came by, and they said, oh, we just come to visit. They said, well, you got to go to church then. You know what they say? I couldn't make because Jeannie and Johnny came. Does God mean more to you than that? He's got to. You got to reach a place that he's more important than anything else in this world. You're not going to make it otherwise. Show him you love him. Show him. Tell him how disappointed you are that you bereaved his heart. That he's hurting inside because when he looks at man, man to this day is still not surrendering to God. He can change your life. He can make you brand new. He can make you happy where you haven't, been ha haven't had happiness. He'll give you all these things. You can have it. You can have it. Listen this morning. I'm getting ready to tell you about this one other incident. I'm getting ready to close. God, you know what man did after, after the flood? Man determined to this day that he's going to get to heaven on uh, the way he wants to, where, how he wants to get there. There's only one way to get there. Right after the flood, and everybody started, life's coming back. People are going on with their lives. You know what they said? Let us build us a tower that reaches to heaven. We don't have to live right. We don't have to do anything. Let's, re let's build a tower that reaches all the way into heaven. And, hey, that's going to be great. You're not going to build a tower to heaven. But you know what? Listen to this. They were so united in doing that. When people, unity is power. Unity is strength. And in the process, God looked down and saw what they were getting ready to do. He said, we must go down and put a stop to this. Why? Because the people are one. They're united. That's the power of unity. When people pull together, there's nothing can stop you. But God said, I got to stop these people. Because they're so united, they're going to build a tower that reaches up here. Because they're working together. He said, I must go down and stop this. He went down and, confound, and confused the language. That's why we have all these different languages all over the world. That's why. Chinese speaking one thing, Japanese, uh, black folks, white folks. 
all over the place. People speaking, some people speaking English, you still don't know if it's English. <laughs> but understand, he said, I got to confuse this up. So today we have different languages all over the country. And we have them because God said, you're not going to build no tower to reach to heaven. You're going to do it my way. Let him do it his way in you. But whatever you want me to do, that's what I'll do. That's what you got to say. Lord, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. If you want me to do that, I'll do it. Quit saying all of that. You can't do this. You can't go to the club. Yeah, you can go to the church club. No, you can't go to the other club. Well, is there anything wrong with having a little drink every now and then? Because with him, you don't need a drink. He's the water that never runs dry. That's all you need, honey. I'm not looking for anything else to give me life. I have it already. I'm not looking for something else where I can be happy. I'm happy already. You're sitting here this morning. You say, Sister Rose, you know what? It's so true. But I always get to that point and I tell myself, I don't think I can do it. None of us could do it without God. I couldn't preach this gospel without him. We couldn't accomplish anything without God. None of us. That's why he said, I'll help you. I'll give you power. I'll put you in a place of authority, power, that you can overcome anything that's bad. You can do it. So this morning, while you're looking, up, looking for another excuse, just can it, baby. The bottom line, you need God. People come up in the prayer line for me to pray for them. I hear all kind of things. And most of the time I hear my boyfriend. That's your problem. <laughs> and my boyfriend, Sister Rose, he, at first they tell me other things. And they say, and my boyfriend, that's it. Right there, the boyfriend got you going. If he can't get on the straight and narrow, bump him. He's not that important. You don't understand I love him so much. Do he love you? Is he working with you? Is he trying to help you to accomplish some goals that are important to you in your life? Man is selfish by nature. He thinks of himself. He gets married. It's all about me. He ain't married. It's all about me. It's just always something going on that he wants, but he's not concerned about what you want. Get with God. That's the one who says, I'm concerned about you so much. That I sent my son to die for you. Only son. I sent him to die. Please accept him. This is my way of bringing you back in fellowship with me. You don't have to be like Adam and Eve running and cover, trying to cover up your sin. I'll fix you where you'll be free. People that's got something to hide are miserable people. They got so many things to hide. This is bad. That's bad. I don't want nobody ever find that out about me. They probably will. Turn your life over to the one that makes the difference. If you, our musicians and singers, please come. If, you, if you're sitting there this morning, say, Sister Rose, you know what? You made me think. I thought about it. The thing you're trading God in for is not even worth it. It's not worth it. It's not going to give you happiness. It's not going to give you joy. Tiffany, honey, I found a man of my dreams. No, you didn't. <laughs> Men are all alike. About the same thing. When you make him mad, it's a whole different story. And he don't mind telling you, baby, don't try to run my life. And I'm here with you, but I don't want no woman trying to run my life because they feel like that's part of their male ego. They're in charge. I'm in charge. You know, go, to, go here and go there. No, not going to have that. Think about it. I know some people in this room right now that's made some mess of their lives, and they know it. Sitting there, that's why you smell. <laughs> you made a mess of your own life. People look around. They messed up. And don't want God to straighten it out. If he's willing to straighten it out, let him. Let him. He straightened me out because I was stone crazy. He straightened me out. Nobody could tell me nothing. I was mean, like a yard dog. People were afraid of me, rightfully so. 
I might say or do anything. God said, but I got so sick of me, and I'm sure you're sick of you. When you get sick of you, you change. God changes you. You come to him and say, God, I need to change. He changed me from that old girl that was miserably unhappy, depressed, sad. I had a good husband, had my children. Why am I sad? I'm sad because the person that needs to be in my heart is not there. And I just got tired. I got tired of being the person that people feared and ran from because you don't want to cross paths with her. A horrible person. I owe him everything for what he's done for me. He put love in my heart, made me love people, and love, have compassion for people and work with them and do what you can. Do what's good in this life as you pass through it. See? He can change you. I don't care how bad you've been. Ain't nobody was worse than me. I was, I was at the top, out of control. It's so nice to know you're in control. You can have it. If he gave it to me, he wants to give it to you. We're going to pray for you here in just a little bit. May I say this prior to going to pray? A lot of times uh, people in the prayer line, may I say to the men, please shake my hand. I do not want to be hugged by men. So to avoid that, and please don't take that offensive because it's not. But uh, feel free to shake my hand. Love shaking your hand. Women, you can hug my neck. Not men. So let me make that clear so we don't have to cross that again. I love you to pieces. Now, I know sometimes people forget, but I saw a fool sitting in the audience one time, and he, he was talking about <laughs> coming up and getting a hug, and he planned, oh, I'm going to get me one. So when he got to me, I already had him on radar. When he got to me, I said, <laughs> look like a cat that swallowed the canary. <laughs> no, no, thank you. So this is for everybody's benefit. Okay, I love you. Y'all got to give us a song. Stand to your feet. He can change your life. You can be a new person starting today. It doesn't take God a long time to do anything. Touch the Lord. 